Hey guys, welcome to Wednesday evening virtual service. This is Wednesday afternoon. I'm recording these announcements. It looked like I did a quick change because Ryan and I recorded the lesson yesterday. But I wanted to give you the latest in terms of announcements for the church. So first off, excited to have many of you back on campus this Sunday. It looks like we're going to have good weather and we will start drive-in church Sunday at 10 a.m. Looking forward to being able to gather, not like we want to, but better than we are now. And that will be live streamed. We've had some equipment ordered and, and coming in this week to alleviate that music sound issue. We had tested the audio with it, had no idea music would be received different than voices. So live and learn in the age of the coronavirus. But uh, hopefully the live stream will be up and running well this Sunday. So if you cannot or do not want to attend the drive-in church, you can tune in at 10 o'clock on Facebook Live. I'll send that link out, and of course, um, it'll be posted to YouTube later in the day as well. A few announcements uh, just in the life of the church. One, the church office is closed to visitors unless you have an appointment, and that's just to keep the traffic down inside. It helps us keep everything sanitized better and just keeps contacts at a minimum. There is a drop box installed at the door nearest the mailbox if you want to drop off anything at the church you can do it there uh, we're still totally available call me my cell phone numbers on a lot of different things uh, we want to meet every need that we can uh, it's just trying to figure out how uh, church life looks in these days it's constantly changing uh, i would love for you to share something good with me i, I sit in on a number of calls every week with other pastors and leaders from the Georgia Baptist Convention, and it's a great privilege I have. And one of the common questions is, what is God doing in your church right now? And so if, if God's doing something in your life or uh, you perceive God's doing something in our church, would you just email me, bill at byronbaptist.church? You can find that on the on our website. But would you just email me and, and give me an update on what you feel like God's doing in your life or in our church in this season? I'd love to just hear some encouraging stories. You know, the it really has been encouraging how many of you are doing well. There's been relatively a uh, small number of difficult things going on, but there's still difficult things going on. And so it would be encouraging for me, and I'd love to be able to share with other local pastors and even pastors I stay connected with in Atlanta uh, about what God is, is doing here in Byron. So I mentioned this is an ever-changing situation. Uh, the governor came out Monday with the possibility of gathering again. I've already told you we're doing drive-in church this Sunday, so we're not gathering this Sunday. I really have no idea when we're going to gather again. I sat in on pastor calls today with Warner Robins pastors and as well as Atlanta pastors later and just discussing all the things that have to go into place. So I'll meet with the deacons this coming Tuesday night, and we will begin the discussions of what it will look like. No timetable. I don't even have a a suggestion on a timetable right now and part of that is because it just changes so quickly uh, I think we lost three in our local hospital uh, just Monday and so we just don't know looking forward but what what I do want to emphasize in these next few weeks is I want a church that's gonna empathize with one another I want you to empathize because I am acutely aware that we have people whose businesses and livelihoods are shriveling up and we have medical people on the front lines watching people die alone and it doesn't matter where you're at on that spectrum you're gonna see things differently in whatever we do as a church it's not there's gonna be a lot of people who think this is too soon or this is too late and and so I just we need to be unified we need to love one another we need to submit to the leadership of the church. And I haven't lost a vote around here since Sunday. So, you know, it's fine. That's why God gives us the body. Like, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. But I do want you to pray and ask God that he would help you empathize and love your neighbors well, love your co-church um, members well, love the leadership of the church well, because these are really complicated issues. And I I have no agenda. Like there, I don't know where this is headed. I just want you, even now, to be praying and saying, Lord, give me a soft heart and, and give me a heart that is um, 
loving your church and loving your people well. Uh, I can say this, it's going to take an army of volunteers to open this place back up. I mean, I think I'm looking at the requirements for social distancing and, and whether it's in May or June or July, whenever we go back to normal Sunday gatherings, it is going to take an army of volunteers. And so there's going to be a little bit of self-selection there. Like if the leadership says, yeah, we think we can open however many weeks from now, we got to start assembling a massive team of ushers and greeters, and then we've got to get them trained. And if the number doesn't come in, then we can't open the building. And so just be in prayer for the deacons as we meet and then other conversations that have got to take place and be in prayer for your own heart. Oh, that this would not divide us. Oh, that we would just long to be together. And, and even if you think we're going way too slow, let it fuel your love for the church and your love to be gathered together for corporate worship. So that's my heart's plea to you this evening. And now um, I'm excited to share with you our conversation from yesterday, uh, part two of our three-part series on worship. Welcome to Wednesday night with Ryan and Bill. We are in part two of our three-part series on worship. I'm glad you're tuning in again this evening. Ryan, welcome back. Good to be back, man. My wife made fun of me for calling you special guest last week, but I think you're special. Well, and I enjoy coming, so we might keep this up. All right, there we go. Well, we're going to continue talking about worship tonight, but I wanted to just call us to, to this time by looking at God's word from Psalm 98. And if we're going to talk about worship, we'll read one of God's instructions to worship. So hear God's word from Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with the trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let's pray together. Oh, great God, you are worthy of our praise. You are, your, your creation screams, you are worthy. Your holiness seem, screams, you're worthy. Your faithfulness screams, you're worthy. The cross of Jesus and your grace scream that you are worthy. Lord, we want to respond rightly to you. We pray that you would help us. Lord, even now as we discuss more of what worship means. Lord, as we try to apply it to our lives, as we try to see the benefits of worship, now, Lord, we pray by your Spirit that you would encourage our hearts and strengthen our faith, that we would indeed respond rightly to your goodness and your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so Ryan, in our discussions before you named off four effects of worship so i just wanted to start our discussion sure. there um one effect that we that we see is the effect of unity so how, how would you say that uh unity is built up as we worship well we hit on this a bit last week um when we talked about corporate worship and um and the idea that corporate worship is a time when we have set aside and we're going to bring sacrifice of praise into the house. Um, corporate worship is not about the individual. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about ascribing unto God. We've come and we've met for that one purpose, that unifying purpose. I'm coming to give God the honor that he is due. I, I recognize who he is. I recognize what he's done. I recognize how I am so beneath him and he's transcendent above us. I recognize all of who God is 
and the great sacrifice Jesus made for me, the fact that he rose from the dead, the fact that I have assurance, that I have salvation and grace and mercy through him, and I come in and I, alongside you, with that one purpose in mind, I am bringing my worship to God, and you are bringing your worship to God, and it's not a time of one-upmanship, it's not a time of I prefer this or you prefer that, it is, it is a time where we set our eyes on Jesus, where we set our eyes on God, and when we set our eyes collectively on who God is, and we're bringing him the praise that he's due, the natural effect of that is all these other things that, that sometimes seem big, that divide us, they, they don't seem so big anymore. Those, those differences in my preference for this or my preference for that, that doesn't matter because in, when we focus on who God is and who Jesus is and, and we are bringing him what's due him, he becomes our focus and we are then unified in what we're doing. So that would, that would, that would be my take on how, to, how is worship a unifying experience. Yeah, I love how unique uh, worshiping the triune Christian God is in bringing people with nothing else in common together. That's right. There's no ethnic uh, rationale behind who is coming. There's no interest. There, mm -hmm. None of those things really factor in to corporate worship of God. We, we have gathered, and there are people that are not like us in any other way yes. who are doing the same thing, yes. giving praise to God. So that, Absolutely. that is that's neat, and, and, it, and at the same time, like, fuels our fuels our desire to give God glory yeah. because, um, well, A, he has created all kinds of people. But also, there's this sense in which um, that his grace and, and his salvation extends to all the earth, and we're getting to celebrate that by worshiping together. And then I, there is a bigger connection between me and you if we're both setting our eyes on Jesus. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you don't have to be someone from Byron, Georgia. You can be from South America or from China. You can be from anywhere. But our eyes are focused on God. And and that's exactly what you were just saying. Okay. So another effect of worship is it gives us perspective. What do you mean by giving us perspective? Well, and I, and I talked, just kind of touched on it just a moment ago. When, when I come and I'm giving worship to, to Jesus and I'm remembering who he is, and what he has done and who I am in response to it and just how worthy he is and how unworthy I am not not only do I then remember um, that he's Lord and I'm not that he's in charge I'm not but I also remember that some of the barriers that I try and build up around me some of the my own prideful sinful things that I do they those, those are just those things. They're, they're prideful and they're sinful barriers that I'm creating and I'm constructing. And, and, and like I said, if we've all come with our eyes focused on building up who God is, these other little things that oftentimes can, can be obstructions in church, that can be divisive in, in church, they, they, they're not really problems anymore. We, we look at on them with the correct lens the correct perspective we, re we remember why we're here we remember what we're doing and we remember what we should be about and the little things become the little things and the big things become big things and we then have god's perspective the the mind of christ about things yeah the little things like us become little. yes, yes. I, i'm thinking here of psalm 98 we just read verse 7 says let the sea roar and all that fills it the world and those who dwell in it let the rivers clap their hands let the hills sing for joy together before the lord for he comes to judge the earth yeah. and the, the rivers give praise to god yeah like we are so insignificant and, and we just need to remember that and and whether it's something you say between songs whether it's uh, lyrics of a song or something in God's word or one of the prayers that are prayed we, we just get our little cages rattled when we gather for worship like if you can stick with me through that six minute prayer or however long that prayer is 
there's things I pray differently than you do that's going to stretch your prayer life. And, yeah. and the same thing's true for me. Like I, I, I'm going to get in my comfort zone in my devotional life. But when I get around other believers, particularly when I'm praying with them, but certainly in corporate worship, my little cage gets rattled and I think, oh, this is a total area of my life I've been neglecting or a total sure. area of praise that I've not given to God or thought, been cognizant of what he's doing. And so all those things, I think, help our perspective. And this is us building up the church. Right. Yeah, none of us have all the answers. That's correct. And even collectively, we don't have all the answers, but we give praise to the one who does, and in that, uh, we're conformed more to his image. That's right. Beautiful thing. That's right. That's right. Uh, thankfulness. A third effect of worship is thankfulness. Well, I, I mean, if we're already remembering what, who Jesus is, if we're already remembering what he's done, if we're remembering the greatness of who God is, um, if we have the correct perspective on things, then we see who who we are. We've already talked about the, in, the insignificant nature of, of, of each of us in comparison to who God is. And we remember the cross, and we remember the resurrection, but we also then remember how he's, he's dealt with my problems in my life. He's dealt with my problems I'm dealing with today. He's, he's given me new mercies every day. How how in view of what God has done, we're going back to Romans chapter 12, in view of God's mercies, how can we not be thankful? Um, and in fact, in, in Philippians, we're, no, Thessalonians, we're commanded, be thankful in everything. Um, and so that's not an issue for a Christian who is remembering and worshiping God because we, we know what he's done. And that's why in the Old Testament, we talked about this last week, he said, you know, write it on the walls of your house and write, put it in front of their eyes. Say, talk to your children as you're coming and going what God has done and who God is so that they will know and remember. And then we worship and we give the thanks that he's due. It's as though he knew we would be forgetful. You're right. You're right. And it's so, it's so easy to forget. It is so easy to get caught up in whatever it is we're doing and forget what God has done. Uh-oh. Yeah, again, going to Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Has he done marvelous things, or hasn't he? You're right. It is so easy in the day-to-day -to, -day to just forget that he's done marvelous things. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. Uh, I mean, it's just easier to turn on Netflix or YouTube yeah. or something than it is to <laughs> contemplate what God has done. That's right. Uh, but corporate worship is one of the reminders that we have. That's if right. corporate worship is a weekly rhythm for us, then it's one of the reminders. Now, it shouldn't be the only one, but it's no. one of them that that allows us to go, oh, you know, God has been good to me. And that's where our own personal devotion time, personal worship time feeds into then the corporate worship, which then feeds right back because we're, we're setting those things before our eyes daily, uh, hopefully daily, uh, hourly, minute by minute if we can, uh, to remember just who God is and what he does. All right, and the fourth and last effect of worship uh, was obedience. So how how does um, worship lead to obedience in our lives? Well, I do know that in, in my own personal life, um, the, mo the more that I know about who God is, the more that I understand the reality of God, the more that I understand what his commands are, um, and if I'm doing all these things in worship that we've already talked about, how can I walk out of a building where I've just spent an hour pouring myself out in worship and then turn around 20 minutes later and disobey his commands? How, how can I come every Sunday to, to his place of worship knowing that Monday through Saturday I totally disregard him and give him the worship he's due? That those two things don't go hand in hand. As we, as we remember who he is, as we are setting setting aside time to worship him, if we're not also in obedience, we're, we're some, there's, there's a step or two that we've missed. So I, obedience feeds into worship and worship feeds into obedience. If you are worshiping well, you're, you're obeying well. And if you're obeying well, you're worshiping well. But if there's a disconnect from one of those two things, then you got, we got problems. Yeah. I know I usually only make one comment. I actually want to make two comments on, on this one. One, again, from Psalm 98. Uh, at the very end of the, the psalm, he says, he, will, he, the Lord, will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. 
And I think when we when we worship, we remember the righteousness of God. That's right. And no greater righteousness than as we see at the cross of Christ. That that God's threshold for righteousness is so high that He alone can fulfill it. Mm -hmm. um, and that causes us uh, uh, to praise and, and leads us to obedience. When we contemplate the cross, when we contemplate the love shown, uh, the gravity of our sin that mm -hmm. it, that in fact it was that serious. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say about obedience, as I've been preaching through the book of Hebrews, a lot of these weeks I've just looked at my my out, sermon outline, and I and I get ready to make application, and it, it's just not been a lot of go be a good neighbor. Like there has not been just easy application jumping yeah. off the page. Read your Bible, pray. You know, it, it just hadn't been a lot of that coming out in these texts. It's been a lot of magnifying who Jesus is, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's still helps our obedience yeah. well actually i know it does but but it's been good for me to have to deal with because i, I want to make great application of every sermon yeah i want you to go out and have something to do on monday and it's going to change the world and you're going to be so pleased and worshipful <laughs> and full of the spirit yeah um and it just hadn't really been that way and i could certainly do better and i'm trying every week to get better at application but some of it is just Cherishing Jesus takes care of so many other things. Like, mm -hmm. If I cherish Jesus, if I realize who he is and what he's done, that affects the way I parent. Yeah. I can be patient with my kids if Jesus is on his throne and if he's proven his love for me. I, I can love my neighbor who's not like me if that neighbor bears God's image, if I'm believing that that neighbor bears God's yeah. image and needs a savior. Like, it, The more I cherish Jesus, the, the more obedient I will be to him. Because I see that he is the greater Moses, as we talked about yeah. Sunday. He is greater than the angels. He is great. He's the, the manifestation of the law of God. He's all of these things we've been talking about, the radiance of the glory of God. And, and that certainly impacts my desire to obey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the other thing we want to discuss was about the, um, the worth. Uh, how much worship does God deserve? Well, if we, if we look at our look at what the Bible says, the Bible says he's worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise. And that's more than just an, on an individual level. He is worthy of all of your glory and all of your honor and all of your praise. And if you're giving glory and honor and praise to something else, then he has issue with that. Um, but there's a very famous quote by a guy named John Piper that says, Missions exist because worship does not. He not only is worthy of all of my honor and glory and praise, but he's worthy of all the honor and glory and praise from everybody throughout the entire world. And there are many around the world who are worshiping false idols, who are worshiping false gods, who are giving their honor and their glory and their praise to one who is not worthy of it. And that is one of the, the fundamental reasons why we are told to go uh, God loves us. He loves them. He wants them to, to know about him and to come to him. But he's also jealous for his glory, for the spread of, of the fame of his name. Our God is very focused on how he is represented in the world. And he is very focused on getting the honor that he is due. And so as, as, we, as we worship and as we look at what God wants to, us from once from us in worship one of the things that we should be doing is going and telling so that he gets all the worship that he is due yeah um so when i when i hear that and think about that one of the just practical struggles i have is where do i draw the line between giving everything i have to missions and i'm thinking mainly Financially, but some people are called. I mean, if God calls me to missions, here we go. Now I'm diabetic, so I don't think, uh, at least based on what the International Mission Board thinks, yeah. I'm not called to missions work. Um, but I still, you know, am blessed with a generous salary and sure. am entrusted with resources. And so there's a struggle there. Whether it's do we eat out once or twice a week and spend a little extra money, the house I buy, the car I drive. Help me navigate some of those decisions at, in light of the fact that this story of redemption needs to go to the whole world. Well, I would, I would hope 
um, that we all are, are cognizant and aware that there is a world, a world around us that's in need of the saving grace of Jesus. Um, I believe that each of us is called to, to be a missionary where we are. God has us where we are for, for many reasons, one of which is you are supposed to influence those people around you, the people in your workplace, the people that in your family, that you are, we are the hands and feet of God. Um, when it comes to uh, supporting missions, um, we, our church obviously does that through like the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and, and the soon to be taken up, hopefully the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Um, but whatever God has given you as your resources, um, that goes back to kind of the parable of the talents. He's given you talents and it's your, your, your job, I believe, to submit to what he calls you to do. And if he is calling you as an individual to go be on the front lines and be in some of these countries that, that need missionaries, then that's, that's a call that, that only you can answer. If he's saying you can figure out a way to live on 80% of your salary and give 20%, that, that's, that is, I believe, an individual response to what God has called on their heart. And, and each of us needs to, to think about that. I think that sometimes we, we get kind of caught up in just doing normal business as usual and we haven't thought through how, God, how should I be using my time and my talent and my finances to expand your, your kingdom here on earth. So you're telling me that I've got to spend time praying and asking the Lord how I steward my resources? That, that's probably the right answer, yes. So you're telling me that the God of the universe wants my time and affection and attention? The God of the universe has a terrific plan that he's been working out since the beginning of time. And the good news is for us is he desires us to be a part of his plan. And so uh, to check in with him on that on a regular basis and say, God, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm not doing. What's, what's, what's the next step for me is, is a really, really good way to go about things. Yeah, that is such a beautiful thing that God desires that, that we would pray continually to him. Like, I love when my children talk to me, but I don't want them to talk to me continually. That's exhausting. Yes, it is. Um, I know what that's like. Yes. And, uh, and we both love our kids. We do. But we are not God. But God wants <laughs> us to continually call to him. I'm always surprised at the parable of the woman going to the unrighteous judge. And yeah. Jesus tells us to go like the woman crying out for justice before the father. And, and what a call to, to just day after day take up audience with our holy, powerful, just, loving God. You're right. Any closing thoughts or comments? Um, no. <laughs> I, I would love for us to pray, though, as we, as we close we'll out. certainly pray and, uh, before we close out. I had some uh, kind of silly questions there about that, and your serious, deep responses just took away my silly well, questions. But, um, uh, that's what happens habit. when you deal with somebody who's mature. It's a habit of mine to take funny situations and make them serious. I got gotcha. you. Uh, well, yeah, I, I have asked Ryan to lead us in prayer tonight, uh, just covering some of the things that I would normally cover and or what's on his heart. And I would invite you to spend some time after we pray here, just praying as a family, uh, looking at the prayer list that's attached to the email, uh, praying for these needs, being faithful to bring these before the throne of grace, and um, just enjoying this great privilege to pray to this great God who is worthy of all our worship. Ryan, would you pray? Yeah, let's pray. Father God, um, we just want to remember you. We want to remember who you are, the, the greatness, not only of your love, but of your righteousness and your justice, Father, the greatness of, of your grace and your mercy, but also of your wrath, the, the greatness of, of, of your majesty and your power. Father, we want to never forget just who you are, the, the almighty creator of, of our universe, the one who holds our very lives in his hands, Father. And Lord God, we want to never forget what you have done, that you have uh, 
preordained from before the foundation of the world that Jesus would die, that your son would die, that, that you would take upon him the, the payment, the punishment, the wrath that we were due, and that all in mind so that we could be with you, that we who were your enemies, we who were in open rebellion against you, Father, we who fought against you, that we might come and be part of your family, that we might enjoy knowing who you are, enjoy discovering the, the immeasurable uh, nature of, of your greatness. Lord God, that we would have an eternity in your presence. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the greatness of who you are and for the greatness of what you've done. And Lord God, I want us to remember who you are as, as we walk through this uh, really unprecedented time uh, where we've got the coronavirus um, threatening so much that, that we love and hold dear, Father, that we know that you're in charge. We know that we've been able to trust you in, in times past and we can trust you here today, that there is no reason, there is no reason, Father, not to trust you, not to walk with you, not to, not to go where you send and do what you have for us to do. Lord God, we uh, ask that your grace and your mercy and your wisdom would be on our leaders, that uh, we, uh, that you would give them the answers that they need, Father, be with the medical experts, be with those making decisions, so that uh, what you would have done would be done, Father. And Lord God, I pray that in, in light of what we've what we've discussed uh, these past couple weeks, that we would remember who you are every day when we go, when we wake up, when we have our time alone with you, that we would learn more about you, that we would learn to worship you in private, that we would, uh, Father, as we discover more of who you are and what you've done, that we would come to your church, that we would come into your house when we meet either virtually, as we're having to do right now, or or when we can finally meet together as, as, as a body of believers, that we would bring you the sacrifice of praise, that we would come with one heart, one unified spirit that says our God is worthy, and we want to give you the honor and the glory that you are due, Father. And Lord God, I pray that as we are in the midst of, of worshiping you, Father, that we would hear your voice, that we would hear the instruction that you have for us and that you would change our lives, that we would not be the same from having been in your presence, Father, that we would go out different, that we would recognize that you love us where we are, but you have no intent on leaving us in our sin. You have no intent on leaving us as we were, but that you daily are sanctifying us, that you are transforming us into the image of your Son. And Father, I pray that we would yield and submit to that, that we would have hearts that are, that are desirous for your change in our lives. And Lord God, I pray that you would give us a burden, a burden for those around us, those that you have put in our sphere of influence, that we might, Father, that we might expand your kingdom here on earth here in Byron, Georgia, and that you would give us a burden, Father, for taking your word, your gospel, to those around the world who are in desperate need of your saving grace, who are dying, lost, and alone, Father, that you would spur our hearts for how we could support missions, for how we could be, be missionaries, Father. Lord God, I pray that you would not that you would uh, give us a greater desire to see your word advanced on this earth, your kingdom advanced on this earth, and that you might receive all the honor and the glory and the worship that you are due, Father. And we thank you so much for how you've loved us. We thank you so much for how you continue to show us grace upon grace upon grace, and that your mercies are new every day. Thank you for how you have given us your son. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this evening.